All right, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the Wild Chat this morning. Um, as you all saw when you registered, uh, today is about um, my 20 years in conservation, um, starting plus minus 20 years ago. And um, my, my idea today is to share some uh, of the, the stories with you guys um, that I've encountered over the years, the really interesting ones. The ones where, um, where it made me think twice and, uh, and obviously ones where, where we had to really um, try and understand what, what actually happened. So, um, so you will see uh, just some house rules quickly, as you can see on the slide at the moment. Um, there is a Q&A box, um, which you guys are welcome to type your, your questions into. Um, at the end of this talk, I will um, use the Q&A box and try and answer as many questions as possible in the allowed time. So um, for those of you that are very f uh, familiar with Zoom, uh, raising your hand is not going to help. Um, so you have to type in that, in that Q&A box at the, at the bottom of the screen. You'll see it come up there at the bottom. So you guys are welcome to, to just type your questions in there. Um, so to kickstart us today, um, I'm just going to take you guys quickly through um, some of the, the ideas of today. Um, so, like I said, the, 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 the talk is around the extreme nature, the things that I've experienced in the last 20 years, the weird and wonderful conservation experiences. So I've been lucky enough to be involved in conservation for, for many years. Um, and uh, there are some of the stories up here which I'm going to try and share with you today. Lion versus honey badger, what happened to us versus lions once, uh, snakes, which is an interesting one. As you guys know, there's always snakes in camp. Um, so, and then also leopard versus a python, a very interesting story. And now, how not to catch a hippo? There's many stories of how to do it. But there's many stories of how not to do it. And then also an interesting story about a leopard that needed a dentist, and then a rhino that almost destroyed a vehicle. So, um, so yeah, there's a few very interesting, interesting chats coming. So just to kickstart, Joe, um, just to kickstart this morning's story, um, you will see that. Um, this is me many years ago. Uh, the cap on top of a, of a ranger or a conservationist's head is very often a tool. So don't underestimate wearing a cap inside um, an area um, where you work with, with animals. So it's a really important tool to have is uh, to, to have that cap on your head. That's me plus minus 19 years ago tracking lines with a uh, with a, with a Shangon tracker called Raimundo Sumbindia, who could basically just communicate in Portuguese and in Shangon, and that was about it. So that's many years ago. Um, then, yeah, you have to, you have to sometimes be, uh, use a bit of innovation to get animals. This was a cheetah female that did not want to leave a boma um, where she was held uh, for a while before we could release her. So we really struggled to get her out of the boma. Um, some of you guys are tuned in today a lot more to the story but um, we basically had to try and lure her out of a out of a boma and this was the only way that we could really do it is by basically dragging her out um with by hand out of a boma so you get to you get to experience some really interesting stuff you get to work with a lot of people um, very interesting veterinarians um like i said conservationists uh, people with real passion for wildlife and um, you get to uh, experience extreme things like you know and starting leopards, starting cheetahs, etc. So yeah, there's some very, very um, that brings me to my first real story, which I want to share with you today. So if we look at this picture on the slideshow now, there's nothing in um, the in wildlife more intimidating than um, than a big male lion lying in front of you like this. I mean, this this particular male lion, I know for approximately 250. That's a very intimidating beast right in front of you. Um, we know that there's a lot of, um, of people that can, that can really, um, you know, relate to this, to have a, to have a really good, um, to have a really good look at all the, all the different ways that lions can intimidate you while out in the bush. So, um, so this is the first picture that I'm going to put up for you guys today. So this story um, relates back to a, to a honey badger, which um, you can only think um, that wasn't really 100% with us at the time. 
he walked up to this this big male lion in the middle of a river bed and um, really went straight up face to face within three meters of this huge male lion. This is the same male lion that I showed you the picture of earlier. So this guy, like I said earlier, weighs plus plus minus 250 to 260 kilograms, where your average um, honey badger um, like that would, you know, a male honey badger would weigh approximately 15 kilograms. This guy walked straight up to a huge male lion like this and really stood three meters from him and had a face off. Now this lasted for about five to 10 minutes. And after that, believe it or not, this huge male lion stood up, walked away and ducked into the bush with his tail between the legs. So there's a, there's a, there's a good saying in Afrikaans um, that says, uh, which means as tough as a honey badger, which really um, emphasizes what I just told you guys. I mean, this guy, this guy really intimidated this huge male lion lying in the middle of the riverbed. And managed him to get up the tail between his legs and walk into the reeds behind him there and the honey badger just walked on his merry path straight ahead um, without uh, flinching so uh, yeah so honey badgers we would think that lions are the king of the jungle i would often disagree and saying that honey badgers are quite possibly the kings of the jungle and just another lion story um a while back we had um we, we had an elephant electrocution. So elephants um, under under power lines, and, and that is a lot of my career. I spent um, working with the um, Endangered Wildlife Trust on the ESCOM EW partnership. Um, that involved a lot of animals and and wildlife and birds, etc., getting electrocuted under power lines. And elephants are one of the species that's really badly affected by by electrocutions. Um, we got a call uh, from uh, the guys from Sand Parks, which told us that up at Malamulele, close to Punda Maria, there was a elef two elephants that were electrocuted by a power line that accidentally fell over. Um, we had to walk up to this, this power line, um, the last 300 meters up to the line we had to do on foot. And with going on, on foot up to this line, um, we eventually approached where the elephant carcasses would be, which was on a, on a little bit of a plateau just above us. Um, when approaching these two elephant carcasses, to our surprise, two male lions jumped out just below these, um, just below these, these this elephant carcass. Um, now, overnight, uh, the guys reported the incident the day before. And overnight, these two male lions moved into the area and obviously began to feed on carcasses. So, for those of you that have dealt with lions extensively, will know lions don't like giving up their food. So. These two male lions then decided they are definitely not going to share this meal with us that they got for free and they are going to take us on to try and try and get us away from their food. Long story short, these, these lions eventually uh, charged us um, so much so that the guys had to fire a warning shot or two just to deter them from us. But because there were two male lions um, and there were, there were basically two, uh, two um, field rangers and uh, two of us, one ESCOM representative and myself, um, we were basically split into the two sides. The one male line came from the left and the other one came from the right. Um, and this continued for, which felt like two hours, but but it was probably just two or three minutes. Um, and eventually when the when the last male line came so close that I could feel the, the rocks, etc., cetera, um, you know, falling against my feet and against my lower legs, I decided to take my cap and that's where the cap story comes in, which I showed you earlier why rangers and conservationists and everybody often have caps um, with them or on their heads is I took this cap and I threw it as hard as I could to this male lion and he eventually grabbed the cap and ran off with the cap and um, they um, then I assume interpreted that they won this fight so that was a, another very interesting but hair raising story with male with male lions. Yeah, so that's just one of the pictures of a male lion which is really focused on you and, and wants to really take you on so that you get very often of lions that are now that when they mean business. Then um, another another very interesting story is always to check your bed for snakes. Now there's certain times of the year, especially down the low felt, where um, snakes, especially around about March, April, um, sort of the time that we are in now, where uh, where you know you often have little cold fronts coming in and snakes are looking for for places where they can. Um, into into like warmer spots and obviously a, a bed is one of those spots and then you know go and sleep there for for the evening so the snakes love 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 to get into bed and late one night about three o'clock in the morning i woke up with a with a with a, with a burn on my my left pinky and um was fast enough when i got the light on just to see the snake disappear um underneath my bed 
and uh, realized, and then obviously I had to look what snake it is um, to try and see um, what bit me just now. And it, and it turned out to be a spitting cobra, which is the, the, the snake in the, in the picture over here. Now, spitting cobras are renowned to, to get into people's beds. Um, I think in my career, I've heard of at least and dealt with at least four or five incidents like this, where spitting cobras have actually bitten people in, inside their beds. Um, long story short, we then had to eventually um, get people to drive us to the hospital at, at three, half past three in the morning. And uh, then got to Tanin Hospital where, where I was lucky enough that the bite was, was a dry bite. Um, just a little bit of venom, a tight amount of venom actually got into me. So uh, two drips later and, and, and I was perfectly fine. But there are a lot of people that are not as lucky as that. So uh, just a tip for people going to Kruger, et cetera, in future and all over the country, you always just lift that duvet and lift that cushion and, and check for snakes because it can happen that these guys climb into your bed. Then, um, this is also a very interesting story. As you guys can see the image, um, the, the frog looks very, looks very happy in this, in this photo. He doesn't look too concerned. But, um, when stepping out in, in Kruger National Park after a hard day out in, in the field, we um, we managed to get, uh, managed to hear the squeaking noise of a, of a bird, uh, of, of be a bird. Um, and this was basically a frog that got stuck um, and, and got, got caught by this, by the spotted bush snake. And the spotted bush snake slowly started swallowing the frog and um, eventually got to the, got to the end, got to the end of this frog and, um, and swallowed the, the frog whole. Um, it was a very interesting sighting because this is obviously something that you don't encounter every day. Um, you got the whole frog in um, and the frog's um, facial expression, this was one of the shots that I got, but the, the frog's facial expression didn't really change much. So, um, so yeah, once again, a very, very interesting um, sighting that we have is. So next up is, is this, uh, which, was, which is quite an extreme sighting. This female leopard was, was one of the females that were collared um, during, uh, during a, a wildlife research project on, on a reserve called Karangwe Game Reserve. Um, this, this leopard um, had cubs at the time and there was some grave concern from the research that this python in picture actually swallowed some of the, some of the cubs. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the leopard, when uh, upon further investigation by us, we, we we saw that this python was actually, at the end of the day, um, bitten open by this leopard and um, a, a impala was removed from the inside. So luckily enough, it wasn't the, the cubs of the leopard that were, that were swallowed by the python, but it was actually a, a female impala that this python swallowed. And the leopard must have heard the audio from the, from the female impala and um, then basically had a, uh, uh, probably went to investigate um, at the end of the day, yeah, this, this female impala um, obviously didn't have a, have a very great ending to her life, but, um, and, and the, the python, neither did the python win the leopard. And that's basically part of the food chain very often, you know, when leopards hear these kind of things, they go and investigate. And this is the kind of issues that you, that you then encounter. Um, so yeah, upon further investigation, we found that this uh, big pythons like this is often female pythons. This uh, python measured over four meters long. Um, which is which is nice and big for for pythons, um, and uh, we also had uh, quite a few male pythons that were that were around this female at the time and were were basically bitten, which we also found um, after we investigated. Once the leopard has left the area, we we found this this adult female python and the males. So um, so yeah, we we were lucky enough to see all of this, and um, and you know record this. And this is one of the the few records that I know. Um, that we that we've got so uh, of of leopards actually feeding on on pythons, which is uh, one of the the most extreme sightings definitely that I've ever encountered in my life. And, um, quite an interesting one is how not to catch hippos. So hippos for reserve managers, conservationists, etc. Often, um, you know, they they are they are some of the most extreme animals to deal with. Um, they are very dangerous. Number one. Um, so hippos are, are one of the most dangerous, most people will tell you. Um, and you know, we, we, we do handle them with caution when working with them. This particular case was a hippo that got stuck between two fences on a, on a road um, called uh, the Gravelot Road running between Karongwe and Makalali Game Reserves. 
And um, the guys had to try and work hard to get this guy back to a river where he eventually crossed back into the reserve. But catching hippos can be extremely tough. Um, it's, uh, it's not an animal that you can obviously just dart and tranquilize. Um, you, you have to try and lure them out of the water first, etc. And one of these incidents was a, was a hippo that uh, got stuck in a, in a reserve, um, in a dam close to one of the lodges where we had, where we had issues around, um, we had issues around the, the, the lodge and, and actually complaining about the smell, etc. At, at, the, at the dam, which was located right in front, as Murphy would have it, right in front of the presidential suite. So long story short, we had to go in and investigate to try and see what the what what the hippo was actually uh, whether it was actually dead or not. We, we decided to use a boat. Um, when approaching this hippo with a boat with one of the rudders, um, I spoke to the hippo just to try and see that we are hundred percent sure it was dead, and it basically wasn't. This hippo rose up and tried to bite like this guy on screen, tried to really bite um, us in the boat. Basically, um, luckily for us, they put it up to the side which gave us the opportunity of, of, of then trying to, to get closer and away from the hippo, basically, at the end of the day. Um, the hippo then went over to the island and turned around and came back towards us um, and charged us inside the water. We were lucky enough um, to be able to get away with this. Um, the hippo charged us two or three times. In the process, I lost one of the rudders when I threw it at the hippo, but we were lucky enough to get away from it and, um, and, and live today to tell the story. So. Uh, the story was uh, even made it into the report newspaper. So, um, so it was really, really, really good. Um, it was a, it was not not the greatest experience in the world, um, but yeah. So it just shows you again, and, and obviously wherever hippos are, they share, um, they share uh, their their water with crocodiles. So really, so it's a really dangerous animal to work with because you obviously have to. Grow these now crocodiles, which can grow often over. So, um, so yes, and then um, we also had a leopard. Um, this leopard was was named Chilawini. He came from uh, an area in Mpumalanga um, where he was uh, basically a, a problem leopard. And in the process of catching this leopard, he, he managed to break um, his canines off, which, uh, which we didn't really notice at the time. And after releasing the leopard, we we saw that he's got some, uh, some issues. Um, we had to the the veterinarian on the right there is Dr. Peter who's, uh, for those of you that, that know the Lofeld quite well, is quite a legend down in the Lofeld. He's been there for many years. Um, and he's, he's, a, he's an extreme, um, he's, a, he's one of the best veterinarians around. Sorry guys, I just had to switch from uh, uh, with mics. I hope you guys can, can hear me a little bit better. Now I'm sorry, I, I hear it, it broke up a little bit. Um, so I'm hoping that you guys can probably hear me a lot better now. Um, so these so these veterinarians, um, like I said, uh, like Dr. Peter Rogers, they dedicate their lives often to to um, to now you know work with these animals, etc. And they are they are really one of the guys that that you know that like I said they. They know what they're doing. Without these kind of guys, work on reserves, etc., would almost be impossible. So, um, Dr. Rogers um, then tranquilized this male leopard. We had a look at his teeth, and we had to actually call a human dentist in, and eventually a veterinarian called Dr. Gerard Steenkamp to, to come and help us, and Dr. Sonia Salia, um, which which really helped us to to actually remove some of these um, these these teeth that cause problem with the leopard, especially his canines, um, and these, uh, this, this leopard went on, and the success story about this leopard, eventually this leopard went on and uh, spent many years on, on Karongwe Game Reserve, um, where he roamed free and, and made uh, about 37 or 38 kills um, at the end of the day, which is a really, really nice, um, nice end to the story. You know, a leopard like this would often be euthanized, um, and, and we gave this guy a chance. He mated with some females as well, um, and he roamed that whole reserve and eventually, like I said, made, made close to 40 kills. So, um, and by 40 kills, I mean he, he literally killed them with, with, uh, without proper canines, which is a really, really nice success story at the end of the day, giving this, giving this leopard a second chance. Um, then my last story for today is really um, around a, a rhino. So, so most of you would, would think that rhinos are quite calm. Um, this vehicle was, was damaged by not a black rhino, but a white rhino, believe it or not. We, we managed to catch two, 
rhinos in Kruger National Park and, and relocated them to Karongwe Private Game Reserve, um, as in the picture. And um, in the process, we, we got, uh, we, we managed to offload the one female and the second female did not want to get off the truck. It was late afternoon, early evening, and um, we struggled to get off the truck. In the meantime, this other female that was offloaded decided to, to start rearranging the vehicle standing around in the area. Started off with this vehicle, but ended off damaging at least six or seven vehicles. Luckily stopped uh, just before um, one of the reserve owners, Range Rovers, which were also parked in, uh, behind a bush there. Uh, thank, thank God for that. But um, yeah, this, this the rhino basically caused close to half a million rand damage in, in a matter of 30 to 40 seconds. Um, in, in, in causing, you know, really attacking these vehicles. We, we can't really explain why. I assume it would be the frustration of being, in, being transported in the truck or et cetera. But, um, but yeah, these rhinos, uh, as you know, are not, are not uh, the friendliest creatures around. Um, so obviously, you know, offloading rhino, like in the picture over here, is, is normally quite a strange business. You know, the rhino normally runs off with his tail curled up and off he goes. But uh, every now and again, nature does turn around and give you a few, um, few surprises. So uh, most people would think that black rhinos would be the ones that are, that are, really, um, are really the aggressive ones, like the picture over here. Most of you know the difference between black and, and white rhino. This is a typical pose for a black rhino, looking you straight in the eye, trying to intimidate you, about ready to charge. Where white rhinos, as we all know, are a little bit more docile. I mean, here's a white rhino cow on a calf in uh, a few months ago. So, so yes. Um, white rhinos can also be just as aggressive as black rhinos, and um, and yes, it's uh, it's it's definitely one of the things which uh, which we should never underestimate. So any wild animal should, in my opinion, never be underestimated, and um, you know we should always take these these animals um, seriously, and when working with them, we should take the utmost. So that sort of ends off my 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 talk for today. Um, I'm going to try and see whether I can answer some of the, the questions um, that people that people asked. Um, so I'm going to try and look at, at my first question here. Um, but there's quite a few people. Sorry. Um, I know I, I see some people experience some issues with um, with, the, with the microphone, but it is, is a lot better now. So if there's any things that you guys um, would like me to to repeat, um, I, I will gladly do that. Um, I see there's no actual um, serious uh, uh, questions here other than actually the mic breaking up. So I'm more than happy to, to try to chat to you guys um, a little bit. Um, is there any way if people can just answer me quickly on the Q&A that you would like me to repeat some of the stories um, right from the start? Um, I would just wait for people to, to comment on that. Um, I see Riani Buerta on uh, asked me why I'm uh, I'm now living um, why I'm now living in quarantine. Um, yeah, I'm now based in Johannesburg. I'm working for the Endangered Wildlife Trust in Johannesburg. I'm still working with a lot of the endangered species. So, thank you very much for that. Yeah, I see Laura's also got a question. She said, "Did the le leopard actually feed on the python, or just ate the impala?" Um, from the inside. Um, okay, so, so Laura's question was, did the leopard actually feed on the python? Um, it is an amazing sight in Laura, and yes, the leopard actually did feed on the python. They ate that whole python. Um, uh, well, half of it, sorry. They ate half of the python, but mostly they were focused on the impala. So the impala was the main, the main, um, the main meal there for the leopards. Um, I've got another question. Um, he, I've got another question here from from Priscilla. Um, how old was she? Um, I assume you asking a question about the leopard, and the leopard was a he. It was a male leopard, and he was about uh, four years old at the time. Um, so yeah. Um, then I've got another question here about Priscilla. What snake was it? Um, the snake was a was an African rock python, which are also endangered currently. So um, so yes. Um, Staking here. Um, another one is a question about the frog and the snake. Um, then another question about the frog and the snake. So the, the snake was a spotted bush snake. The frog, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's one of the grass frog species. Um, but, but I will have to consult with, with one, of the, one of the guys. 
Um, then I've got a question here oh, from Kishalian. Are honey badgers predated upon or, off, or killed by anything? Often, not really. Um, we've, we've had the odd reports of, of honey badgers being killed by, you know, by, by predators like, like, uh, by predators like leopards, etc. But, um, but yes, the, the, the honey badgers are not very often preyed upon by, by other animals. Um, uh, Rochelle Bronkost. Um, ask me, Rochelle Broncos ask me a question, will the leopard die if eating the snake? Um, no, Rochelle, the leopard won't die. And they did actually feed on the snake and the leopard and the cubs both survived. So they, um, so they well, were both fine afterwards. So no worries there. And then from Valerie, where is the last reserve you talked about? Um, so Valerie, um, the last reserve was, was at Karangwe Game Reserve, which is based in the Lowfell, close to Hoodsprite. Um, so yes, it's. Uh, um, then I've got another question uh, by by Lynn. Are are black and white rhinos? Oh, sorry, are white rhinos or black rhinos more dangerous? So in my opinion, um, black rhinos are actually more dangerous. Um, but like I said in my presentation, I don't think white rhinos are are to be uh, not taken seriously. They can also be. Um, quite a serious uh, contender, so, so yes. Then a question from Ilof, do you guys have contacts, contact with poachers? Um, yes, we do. Um, we, we did at the time when, when I worked out on the reserves. Currently, while I'm with the Endangered Wildlife Trust, we've got um, projects looking at dogs where we have guys working out in the field with, with anti-poaching dogs, etc., where they do have. But most of these guys are, um, are normally based in Yes. All right. So I've got a I've got a question about the the uh, to repeat the badger story, please. So, so yes, the just to um to go back to the badger story, it was a honey badger which weighed about fifteen kilograms, which interacted with a with a male lion of about two fifty to two sixty kilograms, which is a massive contender for a small little guy like a honey badger. So um. So the honey badger, like I explained earlier, you know, they, they often take on things you know, 10 times, 20 times their size. So uh, for, for a success story like that for the honey badger, and the honey badger basically intimidated this big male lion until the male lion got up and walked away into the, into the bushes. The, the, the male lion was basically lying in the path of the honey badger and the honey badger made sure that, uh, that he sorted out this uh, male lion before he could continue. So just an amazing story that a honey badger could actually um, you know, uh, take on a line like that and, and actually get him to move out of the way. Definitely a, a very interesting story. Um, Emil asked, did the, did the, um, the, the, the leopard eventually find its cubs? Yes, they, they, they did get back together, uh, the leopard and the cubs. Um, those cubs grew up to be the adult leopards and I think are still roaming around in the reserve, which is really nice. So, uh, so yeah, they, uh, they all, they all uh, all survived to tell to tell the story. Um, then Musa asked me a question based on the rhino damage of the cars. Please advise during game viewing: is there any recommended safe viewing distance? Um, Musa, my my advice is always when it when it comes to stuff like this is you must always give yourself enough space to get away. Um, you know, obviously there's different kinds of viewing on foot and, and and there's obviously in vehicles, but you know when when viewing animals. You must always just ask yourself the question, do I have enough space to get away if this animal charges at me now? And just bearing in mind that animals, you know, like elephants and rhino, et cetera, charge 40, 50, 60 kilometers per hour. And, and you know, the cats also, also a little bit faster than that, around about 80. So you must just take all this in mind when, when, when approaching and viewing these animals to make sure that they, uh, that they are, are actually um, in a safe viewing distance from you. But very good question. And, you know, people, people would, um, People would, would really like to, to, to talk, you know, a little bit more about that. You can always email me afterwards. But yeah, it's a very good question. And from Dion Salia, um, he just says, thank you for all the great experience you shared with us. It was really, he really enjoyed it. Um, so uh, Irene asked, uh, son, Sean, who's 10 years old, would like to know if a leopard had a name. Um, the, the male leopard with, which needed the, the dentist was called Chilaweni. Um, and uh, the the other the other leopard that caught the the uh, the, the python was called Chilo, which means lightning, um, in in Shanghai. So um, so yes, there's a 
it was, there's the both the names for for your son, Irene. I uh, I uh, will uh, if you email me, I will try and get some more um, some more photos to you of that. So uh, really really glad that your son also enjoyed it. Um, I've got a few more questions here, guys. So I'll try and ask as much as possible. Um, uh, Marcia asked, what did you study? Uh, Marcia, I, I, I started off studying law and then did all the field ranging courses, etc. from there. Um, and then I'm currently busy with, uh, with risk management and strategic business management. So I hope that answers um, your question. Um, Anna Marie De Beer asked, how big was the antelope that the snake ate? Um, and it was a female impala, so gee, you're putting me on the spot here now, but I would estimate that they're about between 40 and 60 kilograms or so. So, um, yeah, that would probably probably be about 40 or so kilograms, I would say. Um, that's what I would think, yeah. Um, Nastia asked, at what age do leopard cubs start um, to come off their mother's milk when they weaned? Um, Nastia, we, we had different experience, but, but I think around about uh, 18 months um, from 15 the 22 to 24 months they start moving away you know young males would often move away faster than, than females but um but yeah they would stay for the mom with the mom for that amount of time i would say um valerie asked me is the situation now better um in south africa versus poaching um valerie it to be honest it is an ongoing problem um it's it's not really i, I don't think anybody can really say um, that, that is getting better. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of great people working on it. We have a lot of field branches now in the lockdown that we have in South Africa. We have a lot of people that dedicate their lives and you know, not seeing their families. They, they're classified as essential services. Um, so, so, yes, it's, a, it's, it's definitely a thing that goes on. I can't really say whether it's getting better or not. I think the, the, the threat is still constantly there. Um, and it's something that we need to keep on working on. So, uh, so it's, 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 it's not better. It's not worse, but it's ongoing. So we really need to, to try and keep that up. And um, then I've got a question from Chris, which said, which animal do you fear most? It's a very good question. Um, I'm, I'm not so scared of the cats and, and rhino and elephant. I think my fear lies more with buffalo and hippo. I've had um, too many encounters with hippo to, to not fear them. Um, so hippos are definitely one of the ones that I fear the most. So I, uh, I definitely have a very healthy respect for all animals. But especially for those two. So, um, so yes. Then Jean Marie asked me, "What is the best way to react when you encounter a lion or leopard on foot?" Um, so, Jean Marie, the the best thing to do is to always stand still. Now, I know it sounds easier than normal, but um, there's lots of examples which I can also send you if you email me afterwards, where where it actually pays off to to stand still. I know it's a lot easier said than done, like I said, but um, it is really a I, uh, the right thing to do is to stand still. Obviously, if you're in a, in a group of people, uh, you know, with lions and leopards, they often get triggered when people run away, and uh, they often get triggered to chase. That's how they how they put together. So, um, so definitely, they uh, they are ones that uh, that you have to stand still. Um, all right. And then Irene asked me if it if it came down to it, would the lion beat the honey badger? Um, Irene, I think yes. If a lion put his head to it, um, I think it it wouldn't be too too big a battle for a male lion like that to actually dispose of a honey badger like that, although it won't be easy, but uh, but I think there is um, cases where, where that happens. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, it would, but I think it's the intimidation factor of the honey badger, which is really the the, the thing that most animals fear out there. Um, I mean, there's many videos circulating on social media where honey badgers take on leopards, honey badgers take on jackals, python. There's so many of these videos going around and there's not very often where the honey badger loses. So I think it's the intimidation factor more than the actual strength of the honey badger, um, which, which helps them um, to really, and yeah, they, that's why they are um, very often, you know, the ones in, in the, that come out victorious. Um, then I've got a few other questions here from Musa once again, in an unprecedented scenario, um, where a lion charges towards you um, when you're on foot, what op what options do you have to survive, Musa? I think I tried to answer that earlier. I think your best bet is to stand still, um, and yeah, that's that's normally the best bet that you have is to try and stand still. Uh, lions will often stop, uh, you know, within a few meters. I think the story that I told you about um, the Eskom employees and me and, and the field rangers up at Malamulele at Punda Maria, where we got charged by 
my two my lines when the elephant got electrocuted. I think that's a that's a typical example where we all just stand st stood still and we all you know still here today to tell the story. So um, yeah, so it's a it is still uh, the right thing to do is to try and stand still wherever you can. Um, apologies if I can't answer answer everybody's questions, but I'm just trying to work through as much as possible in the in the time that we have. Um, Joe asked me, what, what is the major differences between the white and the black rhino? Um, and I think Reynard also answered him there, but uh, the white rhino, um, yeah, the, the black rhino has got the more pointed lip and it's obviously a browser, that's why it's got a lip like that. It's almost like a little hand which they use to, to pick leads off. Um, and then um, obviously the white rhino has got the, the square mouth, um, which, which is for grazing. Um, and then obviously there's, uh, I see uh, Charles also answered here, but there's obviously a big size difference between the two. White rhinos are significantly bigger than, than black rhinos, um, but you uh, you will see when you when you in the bush your your reaction of your guide will normally tell you also whether it's a black or white rhino. White rhinos are not seen often, um, but yeah, black rhinos are are, are definitely. Oh, well, black rhinos are not seen often where white, white rhinos are more common. So uh, you'll definitely see when your guide will get very excited when something like that uh, happen. Um, then Anna Marie. Ask me, uh, did the cheetah try to attack you when you pulled it off the back? And now, Anna Marie, what I, what actually the story behind that is that we had to get this cheetah um, out of the, out of the, uh, the, the boma where it was kept temporarily for it to get used to the area before releasing it. So um, I then, uh, I then had to uh, to pull this antelope with the cheetah attached to it out of the, out of the, the, the boma, which we call, which is enclosed area where you where you keep these animals and before letting them go. So um, yes, we so yeah, the cheetah didn't attack me at all. Cheetahs are quite uh, quite docile. Um, they, they're a lot smaller than, than leopards, etc. So they're not uh, not that intimidated by humans. They won't often um, attack humans. So uh, so yes, there's uh, there's definitely um, there wasn't a lot of issues around that. Um, then Caitlin asked me, "Have you ever been bitten by a snake?" Yes, I think. Uh, sorry, you might have missed that story. At the beginning, uh, I might have broken up. I hear my mic wasn't great at the beginning. Apologies for that. But um, yes, I, I was bit my spinning cobra on my pinky today. I've still got uh, very little to no feeling in, in my pinky. I was very lucky that uh, that I actually had a, had a mostly a, a dry bite, very little venom getting in. So um, yeah, so I, I have been bitten by, by a spinning cobra. Um, how fast can a hippo run? Marla is asking. I think 30 to 40 kilometers per hour. I think that's that's how fast they can run. So people often often underestimate that. It's a big, heavy animal, short legs. So yes. Um, then I've got a question from uh, Gisela, who's 10 years old. She would like to know um, how we can help animals in reserves. Um, so so Gisela, yes. Um, I mean we, we've got so many endangered species on reserves, etc. There's a lot of people doing grand anti poaching work, but organizations like what I work for, like the Endangered Wildlife Trust, um, you know, we, we always rely a lot on, on support from the public and donations, et cetera. So supporting, um, you know, legitimate organizations to, to, to help the animals on the reserves is probably one of the best ways to do it, or obviously also to support the reserves directly. But, um, you know, I, I think these days, um, to, to look at legitimate, uh, you know, people working with animals, um, uh, organizations um, that have got very good track records would be your best bet when when um, looking to to help animals so thanks for that Gisela. Um, Lucia asked me is poaching uh, worsened due to less tourism people around because of the coronavirus lockdown? Lucia that is a major concern um, and we have flagged it as an organization as, as something that could potentially um, get quite out of hand so we are very aware of that um, but at the moment it's still too early to really tell whether it is, uh, you know, it is a, a current problem, but um, but we do envisage it being a being a huge issue going forward because a lot of the people, um, you know, around game reserves, etc., are reliant on tourism. They get employed by people um, in the tourism sector, um, and these these guys are obviously dependent on on their salaries, etc., to try and um, you know survive, and and that's basically the only source of income. So it is a major concern. We are busy with projects at the moment um, with some of our partners like. Aha um, and Tourvest to look at, um, you know, looking at alleviating measures for, for communities, etc. around these areas. But yes, it is a major concern. Thanks for bringing that up. So the coronavirus, the impact on, on tourism and wildlife um, might be a, 
a, a, a very big, big thing going forward. Um, so I also had a question from Cedar who missed um, half the talk. He only logged in a little bit later. Um, so yeah, you, you guys are welcome to email me. Um, I will ask our communications department to, to send out an email, which I'll answer a lot of questions. People are just asking, um, you know, what, what, uh, how can they actually get hold of the talk or how can they chat to me? Um, so yes, um, there is uh, a way that we can do that. You can obviously email me. Um, I will put, I'll just give my email address out. So it's, so it's constant h at ewt.org.za. So C O N S T A N T H at E W T dot org dot za. So if people want to email me with questions, I'm getting so many questions in at the, at the moment. So I'm really trying to keep up with it all. But if I don't get to everybody, then, then please, um, Please just yeah, just just email me or, or you know we can maybe arrange. I'll I'll chat to um, our communications department and see whether we can arrange another Q and A perhaps. Um, okay, let me just see the next question. What is what was your first conservation job? Um, so yeah, I, I actually I've actually uh, was a field guide um, right at the beginning. So um, that's why I started off learning um, there, and then obviously wildlife research and reserve management after that. So. My first conservation job was basically to, to be a field ranger. So you learn a lot being a field ranger. You learn how to track animals. You have a lot of interactions with animals on foot, etc. You learn a lot from very experienced trackers and guys. It obviously teaches you a lot of good and bad things. But uh, but anyway, so so yes, we uh, definitely my first job was a, was being a field ranger. Is it uh, Rian's asking? Is it true that a honey badger can turn around in his skin? So very interesting question. Honey badgers have very flexible skin. So there's, there's this myth that they can actually do that. So the, the, the skin is quite elastic and, the, and they can actually turn quite a bit in it. So, so whether they can actually turn all the way around, I haven't seen myself, but uh, there's definitely a, uh, a, a, a way to, 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 to say that they can turn in their skin. Definitely, I've seen it before as well. So there is a way. So they've got a very loose, flexible skin, which they, uh, which they can actually turn around in. Um, yeah, I've got quite a, quite a lot of questions, um, yeah, from people. Let me just try and move on here. All right. Um, what happens to animal conservation during lockdown? Are the rangers going out or is it considered as a non-essential at this stage? So, um, so yes, we, uh, we, Rangers are considered as an essential service in South Africa. Um, conservation as a whole is considered as an essential service. So even at the EWT, um, we also, at the Endangered Wildlife Trust, we also consider it as an essential service. Um, so yeah, we can, you know, we, we can go out and, and deal with emergencies as they come along. We've already had to deal with uh, wild dogs breaking out, uh, snared wild dogs, um, birds that have collided with power lines, um, birds that have been poisoned, etc. So there, there are certain essential services, but emergencies that we, we can attend to. Um, the same with uh, rangers out in the field. None of these guys are, are getting a, a break, basically. They're all, um, you know, still in full, fully employed. They're going out every night doing anti-poaching patrols, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so yeah, it's... Uh... Then I've got the next question uh, from Anna Marie. Um, how many teeth did the leopard have left when they extracted his teeth? So actually, all that we extracted, and we, to be perfectly honest, was just his, his the uh, two canines at the bottom and the two at the top. So we had to remove those because they uh, they were quite badly broken and into the life. So we had to take those off. So we actually only lost four, but those are very important when when they kill animals. So which is really interesting is that they that he that he went on to to um, to to kill so many animals, you know, naturally, um, which shows you that leopards don't only rely on the canines, but they actually allow, you know, rely quite a bit on their brute strength, etc., to try and try and get uh, get people um, uh, trying trying to kill animals. So um, then I've got a question from Ali, which is, did you ever get tick bite fever, and how many times? Um, Ali, I think I've lost count, to be perfectly honest. Um, it's always I always say to people, it's difficult to judge between malaria and and tick bite fever, but I've had malaria twice and, and tick bite fever quite a few times. So um, I haven't really counted all the years, but uh, for those of you that don't know, I mean, tick bite fever is quite a real issue when you work out in the field. Um, you know, when you're tracking animals and working with animals out in the field, you often have um, have ticks um, 
you know, on you and, and they bite you, etc., which can result in tick bite fever. So, um, so yes, it's a, it's a, it's a very real issue when you're working out there. Then Dirk said, thank you very much. Consan is very informative. Thank you, Dirk. Um, Nasty, another question. What different jobs are there as an African wildlife conservationist on site, apart from rangers, trackers, photographers, and vets? So, um, Nastia, there, there, there's quite a, quite a few jobs around conservation. Um, uh, you, obviously, if you look at job portals, etc., you'll see all the different categories. But, you know, just thinking about my own organization, you know, we, we've got um, over 100 employees at the Endangered Wildlife Trust doing a range of things, uh, from people being out being field workers, um, you know, literally out in the field every day to, to scientists, um, to people working with, uh, uh, with, with all kinds of different things. Um, you know, we've got uh, quite a few programs. If you look at our website, you'll see that there's many different careers as a conservationist which you can pursue. Um, not all of it is, is, is in the field. Uh, some of it is quite desk-bound. So um, as I learned, I mean, early in my, my years, I was basically in the field every single day, and now I'm hardly ever in the field. So, um, so you know, you, you, it's, it's, it's actually quite a wide range of being in the field every day right through to, to being, uh, you know, to, to being desk-bound. So we've got a range of people working for us at the, um, at, the, at the Endangered Wildlife Trust. Um, and then, so Teresa says, thank you so much for all the stories. Love hearing about the amazing work that you guys do for wildlife. Thanks, Teresa. We try our best. Um, then Dr. Janssen said, thank you very much for the talk. Hope all is well. And kind regards from Australia. So we have people from all over the world attending the talk. Thanks, guys. Um, and then Charles asked me, is there a conservation program for all the husbands and kids locked up at home with mom? Um, Charles, a very interesting um, question. Um, obviously, these talks that we're trying to do is trying to tell you guys a lot more about conservation. Um, a lot of it is more um, aimed towards kids, um, etc. So, uh, so it is quite a, quite a, uh, there, there is quite a few things out there, but um, I will once again definitely chat to, chat to our communications department and see whether we can do a few more things for you guys around, around getting the kids more involved and, and the moms more involved. I know myself, I've got a, um, I've got a, I've got a, a one and a half year old and a four year old at home. So I, I know the struggle is real, so you're not alone. So, um, so yes, definitely it will benefit me too. So I will really try and, um, try and get uh, some of the stuff out to you guys and make sure that we, we address that. Um, there's a question from Reinhardt saying, does the EWT work along marine protected species as well? Um, right up over the years, the EWT has had a few, um, a few projects around that, working with dugons in Mozambique. We've also worked with uh, dolphins um, along the East Coast, etc. But it is one of the areas which, which we are looking at. So um, it's a very good question. Um, I would uh, really like to uh, chat to you further on that offline. So uh, I'll definitely... Uh, Make sure that you, you send me an email so we can, we can chat about it. Um, then uh, <laughs> I'm getting a few funny ones here. Johan van Weyck, I know he's the manager of Bloberg Nature Reserve. He's asking me what gel do I use in my hair. Johan, I learned at Zoom meetings, people can see you very often. You'll see quite a few videos circulating as well. So um, you have to look your best, eh? So, uh, so yes, so, um, but, but nice, nice one, Johan. Thanks for that question. Um, so there's another question here from, from uh, Reiki who asked, um, I would like to know how many cats, lions, leopards, cheetah respectively we have in South Africa at the moment. Um, and thanks for all the amazing conservation work that you guys do. So thanks Reiki. I will uh, once again, just send me an email. I'll continue the exact, uh, we are busy with the lion census at the moment with a lady called Samantha Page at EWT. She's busy with it um, at the moment. So we are, um, we, we will be able to give you a little bit better information on the lion numbers. Um, I know like wild dogs and, and, and cheetah, um, we've got a cheetah meta population in South Africa, which uh, Vincent van der Merwe heads up in our carnival conservation program. Um, I know he's also giving a talk later, so uh, tune in for that. He's definitely going to tell you more about cheetah and the exact numbers. Um, but they do fluctuate all the time. Leopard, I know there's, there's organizations looking at the moment at, at leopard and, and the amount of leopard out there. But I will uh, engage with you offline, just giving you the exact numbers, um, if that's okay. All right, um, I'm just trying to think here of some of the other questions. Um, yeah, so somebody just said to me here that uh, a hippo runs around about 30 kilometers per hour. He's correct, I said between 30 and 40. So if you chase by them, it feels more like 40, but yeah, 30 kilometers is the 
correct answer according to the book. Um, I've had somebody else ask here, uh, let me just go through this. Um, in a, um, in, um, people just asking, are, are, do animals react differently on foot compared to um, people that act um, in, uh, well, well, how do animals actually act on foot compared to in vehicles? So uh, people are actually a lot better with, um, with uh, sorry, animals are actually a lot better with vehicles. Um, they normally see a vehicle as one unit. Uh, that's why you will often see guys telling you not to stand up um, and not to not to break the, the silhouette of the vehicle because animals get used to that vehicle. So they're a lot more relaxed with vehicles. Obviously, people on foot is a threat to them. It's been for hundreds of years, so um, and it will always be. So they've always uh, seen humans as, as a threat. So yeah, most animals will. So there's a big difference uh, when, uh, you know, in strategy and obviously in reaction when approaching animals on foot versus approaching animals uh, with a vehicle. So I hope that answers your question. Um, Irene's asked, how can schools get involved with conservation initiatives? Irene, once again, I just drop me a, a mail offline, but there are a few ways that we would uh, love to get schools to get involved with, with the Endangered Wildlife Trust. So, um, and especially in this time, I know people are, there's quite a few questions I saw now come through where people are asking how can we get the kids more involved. So, so that's definitely, and I'm glad some of the kids enjoyed it. I thought my 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 talk would be a little bit PG for some of them with the snakes and the, and the leopard images, but um, I'm glad that people and, and some of the younger kids also enjoyed enjoyed the talk. So, so yes, we will get back to you guys on that. I think we have made a note of it. It's uh, it's quite important. Emil says, keep up the good work. Thanks, Emil. We all try our best. Um, um, Super said, thank you, Constant. Um, I know you have a lot more to share. When is the next session? Can you do a second version of this? I've also had some experiences with snakes in my bed. Thanks, Super. Um, once again, I'll chat to our communications department and see whether we can do another session like this. Um, so definitely. Um, then another question, do anti-poaching teams get any military police training or is it standard field ranger training? Um, so it is a, that's a very good question. Um, you know, a lot of guys are trained as, as field rangers initially and they end up working in, in big game reserves, et cetera, where they now had to become with the, with the recent poaching crisis and had to become guys that, uh, that, that had to, you know, engage and, and you know, have more of a, a military background would have probably helped or police background. So that is a, it is a concern, definitely a valid concern. Thank you for that question. And yeah, you know, like I said, a lot of guys train as nature conservationists and then end up doing anti-poaching. So it is a, it is a big concern. Um, there's a lot of uh, work being done around it in South, South African National Parks and a few other, other instances, uh, but it is a very good point. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so then Badu says here, we have a, you have a great radio face constant. When can we expect you in a more uh, permanent role providing insights into your vast knowledge for animals? So thank you for that. And then another person asking, when is the next session? Um, I, I've got quite a few more uh, stories to share with you guys. So I'll definitely make sure that I uh, chat once again internally and, and, and see whether we can do another session with a few more stories. Glad you guys enjoyed it so much. Um, so thank you very much. And then um, Chris says, um, I repeat, you're a great conservationist with a tremendous passion for your job. Well done. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, you know, we've got a lot of passionate people um, around, the, around the, the world working as conservationists in South Africa and in my organization in the Endangered Wildlife Trust. It's an it's incredible, passionate amount of people that all work together for a common purpose. So there's a really, there's a really strong um, con, you know, conservation presence in South Africa and really great people working in it um, and some incredibly passionate people. So right through the board from government to NGOs to, to the field rangers out in the field to you know, the researchers, the um, biologists, etc. So we've really got a, a great a group of people in South Africa working um, around this. Then Yaku asked, is there any hunting during the lockdown? Um, is it not an essential service as food security? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we sort of touched on it briefly earlier. Um, you know, we are concerned that, that poaching and illegal hunting, you know, there, there is a concern, a, a very valid concern that that might um, escalate now that we, we have the current lockdown and corona. But like I said, it's very difficult to, um, to make sure that 
that uh, we, you know, we, we have to, we've identified it as an endangered wildlife trust. We've identified it as a risk um, going forward. So, um, so yes, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big concern for us and we, we are looking at um, alternatives for these communities, et cetera, affected that have lost their jobs to tourism, et cetera, which is, a, as you guys know, I, I think recently somebody told me it's about 10% of the employment in South Africa is, is on tourism. So it's a really, really um, a, a huge concern, not only for, for you, but uh, but for, for us as well. So, but thank you for, and then Monique said, thank you so much for the work you do. It's fantastic. Perhaps we can try a live Facebook or YouTube feed next time. Zoom can be tricky sometimes. Thanks Monique, we'll look into that. And David also said, thanks for the interesting talk and that you're answer, trying to answer everybody's questions. Um, Luandi also said, thanks for a great session. Um, thanks to Andy. Thanks for, for tuning in. I'm looking forward to another one. So I'll try my best to try and see whether I can, I can do another one for you guys. Um, yes, um, I'm just trying to think all the questions that I missed here. Another question on when, when is the next session? So like I said, I will, uh, I'll definitely let you guys know. Um, if anybody have got more on the questions, I think we've got about three or four minutes left. Um, I think we had quite a number. Um, I'm just trying to see all the ones that I I try to answer as many as possible, as fast as possible, as the feed came through. But if there's any burning questions that anybody else has, please send them through in the next two or three minutes, and I'll try and try and answer them before our session ends. Um, I see there's quite a few questions um, which needs a, a longer answer around, um, you know, whether animals are affected by by corona, etc. I think the jury is still very much out on that. Uh, I think for now, we definitely know that domestic animals are not, you know, they're not. We know about the one or two cases, um, which is not verified yet, but we reported about um, some animals in zoos, I think in the US, which, which could have potentially, but those are all, the jury's still out on that. So I think it's a little bit too early to, to really answer those questions. So, um, and then um, somebody said, can you please also cover vultures in your next session? Um, yes, definitely. I will make sure that I do. Um, also amazing birds. I mean, probably my, my most favorite bird of, of all. Um, Really incredible animals um, flying out there, um, doing a job that nobody else wants to do with uh, hyenas. It was also obviously animals, which I've also had a lot of experience with, which are also animals that, uh, you know, people often don't like very much. But yes, vultures is, is definitely a thing that I will make sure that I cover if there's another session, most definitely. Um, we also have a lot of people. We've got our Birds of Prey program in EWT. We've got Andre Buerta, Gareth Tate, John and Lindy, um, Thompson, um, you know, John Davies, all working, Rebotile, et cetera, the guys all working on, on the birds of prey and vultures in South Africa. So, um, so yes, I'm pretty sure if they don't cover it in their talks, just see if they don't cover it. If they don't, I will also definitely chat to you guys a bit about vultures. Um, so will the presentation be available afterwards so that others can be able to see it, can view it later? Yes, sure. I think we'll, we'll share the link with you guys. If I'm correct, there will be a YouTube link for it. So, um, so we'll definitely um, share that with you guys. So, uh, so yes, um, we'll make sure that we can do that. Guys, I think, uh, thank you very much. I think we've had a, we've had a very, very good session. Um, it's about to time out. So I, I heard all of you guys. I think there's some people that would like another session, talk about more stories. So I'll try and do that. Thank you very much for, for tuning in. I really appreciate all the support. Thank you very much.